Carola Burrows, uh, president of the board of directors of New York Fire Club. And I want to welcome, all, uh, welcome you all here. Um, when I first returned to New York uh, from Seattle in 1983, I was just hearing about a wondering why I didn't hear anything about natural and complementary therapies being used for it. And I soon found out that ACT UP had an alternative and holistic treatment subcommittee, which I joined at the time, headed by Bob Letterer, who is now our interim director of development. And he and many others, including Jackie here, and I uh, tried to bring this issue to uh, public knowledge. It's now 30 years later. <laughs> and uh, interestingly, complementary medicine is now a very common phrase, but it's still not being used that much. And uh, we are one of many organizations trying to change that and educate people about it. So um, it's great to have you all here. And um, I'm going to introduce our panelists as they come up. Carter. Um, I've been around for a while. I started an act up in 1989. That's how I kind of got my start with all of this, watching too many friends die, trying to figure out. AZT wasn't really doing it for most people. And, and I began to understand that there was a lot more that can be done beyond that. And then happily, since then, of course, we've had a lot more in terms of antiretrovirals having a terrific impact in helping uh, sustain lives but also with concomitant side effects and problems. So tonight, we're going to start out with a pretty picture. I know you're all focusing here. This is, I, this is my cat toy. It doesn't really work. <laughs> I know you're all focusing on the fish, because basically what we're doing here is we're going to learn about fishing today a little bit. This guy actually happens to also be doing, a, a, you know, the guy on the left here, the Australian. He's uh, doing a, a play in a the, uh, theater in, here in New York called The River. And it suddenly dawned on me, this is a great metaphor. Not to mention, which he's kind of nice to look. <laughs> um, one of my first buttons, CAM versus drugs. CAM being complementary and alternative medicine. I don't really care. It's, it's basically a political thing to basically say, is this a drug the FDA will approve? Can some company make a lot of money off it? Is CAM all just frou-frou and crazy, nothing? No. There are more and more data beginning to come up on complementary, so-called complementary alternative medicine, but at the end of the day, what I'm really concerned about is, does it work or not? And is there evidence base for it? And when we talk about evidence base, usually we're thinking about randomized controlled trials, but we're, there's also empiric knowledge. And Jack is going to be talking about some of that, as well as Dr. Gandhi. And because Dr. Gandhi is going to be speaking of some of the things I'm going to touch on here, and because I want to keep it in the 20-minute time frame, um, I'll probably go through some of the slides a little quickly, but we're going to have time at the end after the three of us speak for question and answer and a little bit of a round table. So first, going on with this metaphor, there's basically these domains that we all have to deal with in life. And we, because we're Western, we like to break things down. Um, I'm not going to read these slides. If you want copies of the slides, they were some on the back table. If you didn't get any, email me. I'm really great with email and I'll uh, send you a PDF or document file. So basically we have to worry about our bodies. How are they doing? And in the process of figuring out what you should do and what you should take, you'll look at where am I right now, right? So how physical health is doing? How is your mental health? Do you have addictions? Are you depressed? Are you in a good state of mind? Have you gotten over uh, substance use history? Are you still in the middle of it? Um, your sexual health is extremely important. 
Um, although at this point in my life, I call myself Onan the Librarian, but that's all right. <laughs> although I can, you know, sit, working through that is an issue. A lot of us have to deal with the issues of sexual function, sexual activity. Do we get enough? Do we want any? How do you do it? How can you do it safely? Um, social participation becomes increasingly important as we're getting older. I think isolation becomes a bigger and bigger problem. And in this internet age where people are more and more sitting at home and you're staring in front of your computer, that's not a healthy way to be if you don't create social interactions. I mean, I'm 54 now and I'm feeling very grateful that I've always played the violin and I have a bunch of people that I play music with. I do chamber music for kicks. But having and keeping to and sustaining those kinds of activities is critical for good health. Uh, there was actually an interesting study that came out today saying that people who write, so even just the act of writing, writing about your situation, your condition, just making up stories, dreams, whatever, is actually very healthy. And they, there's even a study that they referred to, which I didn't look at yet, uh, saying that's useful for people living with HIV. And of course, access to health services, which is, as an ACT UP activist, we have a problem with this still in this country. We have these data that just came out showing that so few people with HIV are actually on antiretrovirals in this country, and of those, so few are actually getting undetectable viral loads. It's a shame. It's actually criminally screwed up. So one of those social activities that you might consider is activism. ACT UP still exists, for example. Now, negotiating the river. Um, there's a lot of different domains within the physical domain, of course, that we have to address. Some of these are related to HIV disease as it progresses, uh, or residual HIV that's still there causing trouble, even though you might be undetectable. And some of it is related to medication side effects, antiretroviral drug side effects. But the main domains of these that most of us are facing are cardiovascular health. How are your, how's your heart functioning, your veins and your arteries? Uh, are you having problems with hypertension, uh, with occlusion of the arteries, um, is your D-dimer level, what have you. Liver with co-infection, um, I'm living with hepatitis C, and actually I'll talk about that momentarily. And one of the things about these slides is this is kind of a general overview to a certain extent, because each of these areas I could talk about for in about two or three hours. The hepatitis C and hepatitis B co-infection would be, I think there's a great deal that we can do in terms of complementary alternative medicine, and I've been doing it quite well, but there's also a lot that we can do. We can actually cure hepatitis C today if you are actually sick enough. If you have co-infection, you can be cured. Uh, they, but we, the big problem, of course, there is the drug companies and the drug prices. Uh, kidney problems, uh, usually related to nonfibrillar and protease inhibitors. Uh, bone health, managing and preventing osteopenia, neurological troubles. So these are the range of things that people have to address and face. And some of us have these problems, some don't. To the extent that we can limit them, all to the better. Now what causes a lot of these different issues? There are some overlapping or underlying issues that seem to be similar in many cases. So for example, inflammatory cytokines are very often found to be elevated, including the cytokines are basically these messenger molecules that inform and tell cells what to do, either the cell itself or neighboring cells, whether it's a lymphocyte or a macrophage, what have you. So you have inflammatory ones like interleukin-1, 6, tumor necrosis factor, uh, alpha usually, D-dimer, TGF-beta, when these are elevated, and they can remain chronically elevated even in the context of fully suppressive antiretroviral therapy, they can cause uh, continuing problems and chronic problems. Some of these may be addressed by using CAM therapies. Again, the data are somewhat limited, but for example, they did one small study years and years ago on L-carnitine showing an impact on normalizing a TNF level if it was elevated, but not really having any particular impact if it was normal. This was kind of an interesting thing, and it hasn't really been followed up very much, um, because when they looked at other drug therapies to address TNF, they, like pentoxyphylline, it tended to wipe out the TNF. So these aren't necessarily bad things, and when they would wipe out the TNF, you would have other problems. But you need to have them in balance. You need to create balances in our bodies. 
compromised gut function is probably one of the first serious things that happens in HIV disease because that's where all the HIV goes, because that's where the majority of your lymphocytes are. So this is actually what I started to do when I was in ACT UP. When I started, I was in the treatment and data committee and then I was in this pathogenesis subcommittee and what we were doing was looking at how does HIV cause AIDS? Where does it go? I mean, one of the things you, we hear about, of course, is that HIV infects a T cell, replicates, buds out, HIV comes out, CD4 dies. That's true, but it's only a tiny piece of the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, most of the T cells that die aren't infected. They're dying because of uh, a bystander apoptosis or cell suicide. And again, because the gut is the first site that's affected and infected, even with suppressive antiretroviral therapy, you see a fair amount of virus causing damage to the gut lining, causing uh, the bacteria that are in there sometimes to get into the bloodstream, which is uh, usually expressed by a marker called LPS or lipopolysaccharide. And when that increases, this is an, an example of inflammation in the gut causing continuing ongoing problems. Also, neurological damage, uh, peripheral neuropathy, the tingling in the uh, extremities, uh, the cognitive disorders and dementia that can arise, um, although happily, well, there's still problems with neurological disorders. Again, some of these, the underlying problems with them are inflammatory. And then, of course, endocrine disruption with testosterone levels lowering in both men and women. Um, so basically, the, it starts not with taking a pill, but taking care of yourself. So how do we make, make sure that the river is working well? Well, it's the basic simple things we've all heard about. Eat better, sleep, um, exercise. Cannot be said enough about how important uh, resistance and aerobic exercise is. If the very first thing you can do, and also as an empowering thing, is to identify what's going into your face, and what can you do to change that to make your life better? So if you're having Coca-Cola, that's one you can drop, <laughs> frankly. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything positive to be said about You know who I'm looking at. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's psychotic about it. If you like a Coke from time to time, it ain't going to kill you. But it's also one of those things that if you drink it steadily all the time, it's nasty. All those processed foods, um, sodas, there's better alternatives that are better for your body that have less of an impact on obesity, on kidney function, on the whole range of things. So starting with that is extraordinarily important. And then, you know, tobacco, alcohol, drugs. I've been there, I've done them all. And I've basically <laughs> gotten over them. I used to shoot heroin. It got boring. And then we can start talking about other things that you can do beyond that, uh, that initial starting to address these issues of diet and I mean that's kind of why we were very happy to have the food that Jared and the, the center have been able to provide for us here at CUNY is decent healthful food. It's good. Water, no coke, you don't see Doritos back there although we threatened that earlier. <laughs> um, chocolate. <coughs> chocolate is good for you, that's all right. <laughs> there are some, you know, good food in there. Um, and then of course Going back to mindfulness meditation, I know Jackie's going to get on this centering, focusing, relaxing. I wish to God we'd teach kids in school how to meditate. Just as the first thing that people could do, it's really simple. All you do is you sit and you breathe, right? That's it. Have you tried? How many people have tried meditating? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, well, okay, you're locked up with. I can't hear Oh, I'm sorry. Then yell at me if I'm not loud enough. Okay, do you meditate? Do I what? Meditate. Meditate. Oh, uh, yes, sort of, yeah, because I, even when I, do, when I lay down to take a nap, I usually, around 7, 7, 7.30, before I turn on the television, I lay down to take a nap, and even if I don't sleep, I just lay there quiet and think. And, well, actually, the Relax. idea of meditation is to not think. <laughs> And that actually is extraordinarily hard, as I know all of you know how tough that is, uh, because the thoughts come up constantly in your mind and you're trying to let them go. Uh, what I like about it is it kind of shows you where you are and the kind of thoughts that are coming up in your head. And then you can start to have a little bit more, again, it's a self-empowering type of thing, so that you're beginning to say, 
when you get into one of those moods where you're walking down the street and she's walking just a little too damn slow, and you can say, wait a minute, chill, relax, let it go, or just be with it. But managing that, I think, is critically important. And all these things are the first basis, eating well, sleeping well, stress management. Now, we can get into looking at, there's two different kind of ways you can look at su supplements. You can look at, okay, what is the supplement? What does it do? So there's things like curcumin, there's NAC, there's alpha lipoic. There's a simple multivitamin. And the other way to look at it is, what is the issue that you're facing? Do you have peripheral neuropathy? Do you have liver enzyme elevations you're facing? <coughs> so I'm going to break it down a little bit here on... Um, this is a, a study that we've just published, or I haven't published yet. We actually got the uh, report back. This is my good news I got last Friday. Um, I'm working uh, with my other organization, FIRE, with a group at Mount Sinai, doing something that's called meta-analysis. And in, in meta-analysis, basically what you're doing is you're looking at the data. Because one thing we're missing still, although there's more and more happening, is clinical evidence-based data on the use of these types of interventions. Now, the, uh, we, public, we submitted this uh, analysis some six months ago, and we're using a kind of a form called Bayesian statistical analysis. But we also used what's the more traditional form called frequentist analysis, just looking at the progression of disease among adults not yet on antiretrovirals. So we're not making any comments about people on antiretrovirals. There's not quite enough data to comfortably for a physician to make that kind of statement. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, I just say do the multi if you can tolerate it. But what we found when looking at these three different studies was, it, it, I wish I had a pointer, but that over there. Um, it's basically a frequentist analysis that shows that there's about a 40% reduction in the rate of disease progression. And that's kind of dramatic. If you think that you have uh, 10 years uh, from the time you're infected till you get AIDS, supposedly, more, less, whatever. And you take a very simple and very inexpensive multi, because these studies were done in uh, Tanzania, in Thailand, um, in Africa, basically, and they, you were using um, relatively simple combinations of uh, vitamins and minerals, and they were inexpensive. So they're ranging anywhere from as little as $10 to $40 a patient a year. Now those are prices that are available in Africa and Southeast Asia, not so much here. Although there are ways to access a multi through ADAP and things like that. That's another big issue of how do you access these kinds of interventions if you don't have money. Um, so we're, we got back a response from PLOS One saying, uh, we have minor edits, resubmit, and so I think we're going to have this uh, article published hopefully in the next couple of months or so. Um, and we're working on other questions around um, the kinds of interventions that are being used to manage HIV. And the bottom line is basically another area of activism that I think we could all engage in and would be extremely useful is to push to get more of these kinds of clinical studies to say, do these things work? Are they a waste of money? Do they have problems or other issues that we have to face? So another kind of area that we've been looking at, I've been just working on a, uh, reviewing the data on the, the metabolome um, or the, sorry, the microbiome, different ohm. Uh, the microbiome is basically the, the bugs in our guts, and there's more and more data coming out about this. The New York Academy uh, seminar presentations about the microbiome, and we're beginning to understand how critically it important it is in immune system health, in physiological health, and what have you. And when you look at the kind of supplements we have, which are either in a pill form or you can find them in yogurt and what have you, they're either... Um, Probio oops, probiotics, which are bacteria, prebiotics, which are insoluble fibers, or the combinations of the two. And because there's all this issue of gut function being damaged by HIV, I think it's becoming clear that there can be some value in using some kind of supplementation to replace the gut when it's been damaged by many years of antibiotic therapy, which wipes it out, uh, by the inflammation caused by HIV itself. The interesting or the tricky question is, um, what's it good for in some respect? So there have been some studies looking, for example, at um, inflammatory cytokines like LPS, and when they come up in the blood, does the, do the probiotics actually help that? In some of the studies, yes. In others, not so much. 
Can it help with things like diarrhea that doesn't have another identifiable cause? So if you have a diarrhea that's related to an infection, obviously you want to get the infection dealt with and cleared out. If you've got amoebas, get rid of the, uh, the amoeba infection. Um, but once you've taken the antibiotics, you've probably lost a lot of your microbiome, your natural gut ecology. So they've looked, they've, the, some of the studies that have come up, they've looked at specific strains of lactobacilli, for example, like lactobacillus ruteri, GC14, or something like that. I forget the exact strains. And in some of the studies, there is benefit in the diarrhea in terms of the number of days with the diarrhea, the duration, the frequency. And this is where we begin to have the problem, because they're using different interventions, they're using different outcomes, and they're having um, different uh, uh, effects that are variable. Figure out which microbiotics are the best, uh, or which probiotics are the best, is still, not, is still an open question. I think if you have diarrhea of unrelated, of unknown, or of unrelated to an infection, the Saccharomyces boulardii fungus is probably the best data for managing diarrhea. Again, my gut feeling, and sadly a lot of this is flying by the seat of our pants, is I use 50 billion a day. I don't have HIV, I've got hepatitis C, but I've also got severe periodontal disease, which I've been helping to manage a little bit by trying to replace the pathogenic bacteria in my gums with some probiotics and CoQ10, which has saved my teeth. That's another story. Anyway. Um, and it, uh, another way to look at it then, of course, is what's the system that's going awry. So if in many cases, uh, people with HIV are seeing os osteopenia and or full osteoporosis where you have bone loss. And again, this is another reason where exercise is extremely important. We also have, I could do a whole uh, session just on vitamin D. It's another question we're beginning to look at. There are scads of studies showing that people with HIV generally have very low levels of vitamin D. There are very few studies saying, what happens when you give somebody this really cheap and expensive vitamin? Um, what we're, when I looked at the data, what I'm seeing essentially is that if there's a meta-analysis in there, it's probably something to do with a marker called parathyroid hormone. And generally, we, we see that when you give vitamin D, two things tend to happen. You tend to see serum increases in vitamin D, and you tend to see a reduction in parathyroid hormone. Whether it actually helps replate the bones, Probably not alone. And again, this goes to biology. Um, the, it's not just vitamin D that you need for your bone health. You need calcium, obviously, but you need a variety of other vitamins and minerals. You need vitamin K, you need calcium, silicon, magnesium, zinc, copper, manganese. All of these are part of the process of bone uh, generation and making bones. And those will only work if you have a gut that can actually absorb them well. So again, it's a matter of dealing with your gut first. I'm going to step back a second and say, if I was actually, the thing that I've seen work from my own experience in working with people over the last 25 years, because I, before, when I was with ACT UP, I, then I was working with DARE, and so I've talked to a lot of people, uh, is generally a, a probiotic with glutamine, um, and maybe a prebiotic fiber, and diet changes. And those things seem to tend to help with uh, diarrhea that may be related to, say, nelfinivir or protease inhibitors, or what have you. So again, um, there, there's data coming out, but we still don't have enough. <coughs> Could a physician comfortably tell you, you need to take all those minerals and vitamins? I don't know, but you'll find most of them in any good multi. So, and vitamin D, again, is cheap. We still need more data. Here's another area, a system area. Uh, neuropathic pain is another um, paper that we had uh, in publication in pain with the meta-analysis group at Mount Sinai. And uh, I highlighted, or I bolded, two of the interventions that may be helpful in managing uh, neuropathic pain. Um, well, first, of course, you can consider switching, like if you're on a drug like Stavidine, otherwise known as D4T or Jared or whatever, uh, you can consider switching to nasty drug anyway. But a number of the antiretroviral drugs can cause neuropathy, and HIV itself can cause neuropathy. The, we have some limited data on these interventions listed here. B12 is one I would try because it's extremely non-toxic, and we know that there are low levels that correlate with more rapid uh, advancing uh, disease. And it's cheap, so I would throw it in. Whether it'll help with neuropathy on its own, I doubt it. There's one study of acetylcarnitine that Dr. Yule and his group in the United Kingdom did, and the when they, this, the follow-up studies they did using lower doses of a gram a day didn't work. 
but the study that they did with using three grams a day, that seemed to have an improvement in neuropathic pain. Uh, that was actually what we originally intended to do our meta-analysis on, but there was, weren't enough data, and uh, an anesthesiologist from Germany that we've been working with, I threw a paper at him, I said, why don't we look at this? And he said, yes, let's do this, there's enough data. So we did a meta-analysis of the use of cannabis, um, and you all know what cannabis is. <laughs> I'm sure none of you have ever used it in your lives. Didn't inhale. Oh. Didn't inhale. Turns out it works. <clears throat> How well does it work? Uh, fairly decently compared to most other drug medications, and it has fewer side effects than most drugs. Um, I would use cannabis personally before I would use something like gabapentin, about which Pfizer lied. Um, they actually got convicted for lying about uh, the uses of gabapentin um, or Neurontin. And I've had heard scat. Some people I know have said Neurontin has helped them, but the majority of people that I've talked with over the years basically say it hasn't done anything for their neuropathy. And I think that's probably because um, it doesn't work and they, they, they suppressed data showing it was either equivocal or not working, and for which they were convicted for fraud. Uh, cannabis, but of course, some people can't tolerate it. I can't really. I mean, the only time I use it is if I have a back pain, and I smoke a little right before I go to sleep, and boom, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Takes care of it right away. Um, and another area of actis activism and engagement is the rapidly changing field of getting rid of the ridiculous Schedule 1, because Schedule 1 drugs like marijuana, LSD, Ibogaine, are all supposed to not have any medical value, they have medical value. And they can be fun sometimes. <laughs> and Okay, so cardiovascular risks, there's obviously a lot that can be done with this. Um, clearly the drug companies would prefer you take a statin, and for some people maybe the statin is what works best, but frankly I would try some of these other uh, interventions. Niacin has uh, been around for years and some people don't even consider it CAM because it works so well to lower LDL and raise HDL, but you need anywhere from one to three grams a day and you have to get over the uh, uh, flushing and itching. And if you can manage it, go for it. Some people can't tolerate it at all. So again, this is what it comes down to. No matter how much data we have at the end of the day, where are you and what can you do? Uh, CoQ10, there are increasing data coming out about coenzyme Q10. And frankly, I think the, the, the way it works best is at these higher doses. And that's a bit unfortunate because it ain't cheap. This would be a great area for activism to get the sick covered by ADAP or Medicaid. Um, and just in general for reducing inflammation, the N-acetylcysteine or NAC, alpha-lipoic acid, curcumin, I use all of these. I use about 600 milligrams of um, CoQ10 a day. So the garlic cure? Uh, yes, actually, yes. The, the, the garlic data are mixed, but there's, it's, it's interesting. I'd love to look at that more closely, but the, the effects on cholesterol with garlic, for example, some studies are, yes, the allicin component of it is extremely useful for parasitic infections. Just a word about fish oils is that they are blood thinners, so yes. if you're on blood thinner, you got to be careful about taking fish oil. Correct. Thank you. Yes. What about plant sterols? Uh, they're very expensive, and it's a good question. I've I, seen them work in lowering cholesterol. Yes, and I have too. Uh, and I, I, good question. I don't have a quick, immediate answer for you because I haven't looked at those data right off the bat. Uh, and I want to get to my favorite one, which is my disease, hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. You can get be cured with hepatitis C now. They have two drug combinations that in 12 weeks, for most people, will eliminate the virus in over 90% of people with no side effects. Of course, one drug by Gilead called Sofospivir, or what's the, what's the, Sovaldi, I, I don't use uh, the, the brand names because I, I'd rather be able to find the generic somewhere else, which is probably what I'll have to do. They charge $1,000 a pill, for a pill that costs $1 to make. These bastards are evil. Here's another great area for activism that I'm getting increasingly involved in because for me, uh, my, in 1999, Doug Dietrich did my biopsy. It came back with somewhat advancing disease, a little bit of fibrosis. Uh, I think it was F2 maybe, and that was 99. 
And I've been doing an enormous number of supplements, including Chinese herbs like Hepato C. And I finally got health care again this year with the Affordable Care Act. Dietrich wasn't on. They lied about, Metro Plus lied about whether Dietrich was there. But Doug actually said, oh, come in back in here. We'll give you a, a fiber scan, which is kind of like a sonogram for the liver. And they looked at my liver, and the text basically said, you know what, I'd give you an F0, but they only rated F0 to F1. I said, OK. And F0 basically means it's better off than it was back in 99. So then I also got blood work done from my PCP, my ALT is normal, AST, GGT, platelets, everything's normal, which I was a little surprised at. But my viral load also was going from, had been in the 90s, like anywhere from 400 to 900,000 which is not bad for hep C. In the last couple of years at Bellevue, it was 4,000, 6,000. So I was like, is that a lab anomaly or what? So when I got the new doctor and I got the new labs, I was curious to see if it would still hold up. 13,000. This is nothing for virus. So I'm basically OK, but on the other hand, I would really like to get these two drugs. So Fosfavir and Decladisvir would be my preference. Get rid of the damn virus so I don't have to take all the herbs. Although I can tell you, for my teeth, I'm going to still take the CoQ10. Um, and of course, I try to address all these other issues of exercise and nutrition. I don't, I don't have any money, so I don't join a gym. I just do exercise at home. I got a couple of weights, I do some push-ups, and keep myself in decent shape. And I play the violin; does not go too crazy. A huge issue again with a lot of people, and I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to move it along. I'm going to leave the meditation to Jackie to discuss. But depression and anxiety are enormously problematic, and I've had a lot of friends go through it. There are some supplements that I would absolutely give a try. Fish oil, for example, but again, uh, there's always these issues of um, managing your other meds and blood thinning and issues like that. Mm -hmm. Sammy's a really good one. <coughs> Esadenosyl methionine, it's not actually, well, yeah, actually it is there. Vitamin D, 5-HTP, some of these have been looked at for managing depression, and they're certainly worth a try. Um, magnesium. 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 Yes. Thank you, yes. The serotonin. Yeah. Can't make serotonin without it. Can't make serotonin without magnesium, <laughs> yes. Yeah, like I said, this isn't covering everything, so I'm going to move quick. So how do you figure out what you want to do and what works for you? Um, so first is identifying what is the intervention. Is it a multivitamin? Is it magnesium, curcumin? What does it do? Um, what effect are you expecting to get out of it? So like if it is uh, an antidepressant effect, can you try to take the thing and maybe make yourself a little scale, uh, 1 to 10, and a little diary, and write and say, okay, my depression is an 8 today, which means you're feeling like shit. That's the way you want to do it. And then see if it changes over time. Or you can look at blood work, if there's a blood work marker that you're expecting to have a change. So how do you assess this yourself? Um, are there studies out there, particularly in humans? How well, how good are the studies? And we'll look at that in a moment. Again, interactions with other medications, which there can be, like fish oils can thin your blood. Uh, are you on something like warfarin? Does that mean you can actually reduce your uh, dose of another drug because you're managing it with, side, with uh, um, a supplement of some kind? This is why I think it's really good to bring your list, if you're taking any supplements, bring it to your doctor and say, look, here's what I'm taking with me on this. And if they simply dismiss you out of hand, you might want to think about finding a different doctor. Fortunately, that's happening less and less. I'm finding more and more physicians are becoming more aware. Um, interact with that. And uh, again, how do you assess it? By your symptomology, your blood work. Can you see if there are significant changes? Because a, a, a thing might work well in a clinical trial, but it may not work for you. Or it may not work so well in a clinical trial, but it does work for you. Uh, and then you can at least then begin to try and isolate these different agents that we're trying and test and make comments about it. Um, there's a lot of us out here doing this kind of work on this panel, uh, the body. Um, we've had a lot of other people like Nelson Virgil um, who can answer questions uh, that, so for example, Nelson's really great for uh, issues around the endocrine system and the use of anabolic steroids. He knows a lot more about it than I do, and half the time people, when they come to me with a question like that, I say, here's Nelson's email. Give Nelson a, a PubMed is an uh, excellent resource for um, getting clinical trial data information. Again, share the protocol with physicians, what kind of a study 
have they done? Is it just an observational study? Have they randomized it? Is it controlled? So there, if you want to start to read the actual literature, and I think that's really important, don't just go out there and start looking at any website that says .com, great vitamin, take plenty of it, and we'll make money. I mean, you'll be better. You'll live forever. Some of them are okay, like Life Extension Foundation. I mean, they're definitely selling pills, but they're also right-wing crazy libertarians. In fact, there's a lot of right-wing psycho-Christian fundies, and I'm sorry if anyone here is. Um, but they, they, they make it kind of doubly difficult because they're pushing these very strange right-wing notions, like sometimes HIV doesn't cause AIDS notions, which I think is, it is crazy. Uh, and there's, but, they, but if you look at those kinds of websites, what you do is you look for, do they reference a clinical study? Or do they reference data? And very often they do, and Life Extension actually is one of them that does. Fairly. Thorn research is probably better because they're politically a little bit more um, indifferent and they're more interested in science. And then go to the original literature through places like PubMed, and you can assess whether a, a study, what they call PICOS, which is looking at what population was studied, uh, men, women, children, mice, kind of preferred in humans, uh, what was the intervention that they looked at, so again, like when we were looking at the multivitamin, there was a somewhat vari a variety of different uh, ingredients in the multi. And even with a probiotic, there was different strains, sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes four. Did they have a comparator? Uh, was there a placebo control, a sugar pill, or was there just um, a kind of uh, uh, another agent that they used, like a drug agent or what have you? What outcome were they looking at? Did they change their outcome? So if they were primarily looking at the CD4 counter viral load or the impact on diarrhea, did, what did they find in that primary outcome? And the study design of uh, whether it was observational, randomized, or what have you. Uh, and then there are meta-analyses, but you have to read them all carefully. And if you're having trouble reading these, you can ask us. Duh. Yeah, our protocols change with time. I, I, I've followed mine for years, and if you can write down your protocol, it changes over time. And include all your meds in it, and what have you. Um, and that's it. Um, basically, what I think that is... <coughs> to, to, the more that you can actually look at what you're doing, and mark it down, and be aware of it, the more you can begin to change what you're doing. Obviously, I couldn't go through a lot of more specifics, but to the extent that you have more questions, yes, throw them my way. Uh, email is probably the best way, and I can come back with you with whatever answers I know, and then there are other people. Don't rely on just one or two sources of information. Um, and I'd like to then pass it on to Dr. Gandhi and get some more clinical data.